Merci. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to start by respectfully recognizing and acknowledging that we're gathered here today on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional lands of the Wallisiuk. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Wallisiuk, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Wallisiuk, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Je suis fier de représenter les habitants de Memramcook Tantramar ici dans cette assemblée législative de faire valoir leurs préoccupations ainsi que leurs espoirs et leurs aspirations pour leur communauté, pour nos communautés. Un budget permet d'établir des priorités et établir des priorités implique de faire des choix. Ça veut dire de s'occuper de certaines choses et d'en laisser tomber d'autres. Mais, mais veut aussi dire que vous choisissez les choses qui sont les plus importantes, celles qui sont essentielles au bien-être de votre province et des gens qui y vivent. Je ne suis pas convaincue, Madame la Présidente, que ce budget tient compte des défis cruciaux auxquels nous sommes confrontés en tant que province. There are so many missed opportunities in this budget, Madam Speaker. Mais avant de continuer, je veux dire merci. Uh, I want to thank my family. As everyone in this chamber knows, uh, we, we cannot do this alone. And so whether it's family or loved ones that support us, I want to thank especially my husband, Steve, and my daughter, Quinn. Uh, I want to thank uh, my constituents uh, for their support. I want to thank my extended family and friends. And I also want to thank my constituency coordinator, Christina Dunfield, who, who works very hard to serve the riding of Mamram Cook Tantramar. Over the past year, we have learned a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic. I was hoping to see investments in the budget recognizing this. For example, paid sick days for those who do not currently have access to them. We are asking people to stay home when they are sick, when they have symptoms. But how can we expect this from minimum wage workers who need their paycheck to make ends meet? This is an issue, as many issues that were exposed during the pandemic, this is an issue that existed beforehand but has come to the forefront, and yet we are still not dealing with it. This is also an area that has a disproportionate impact on women, especially those who uh, have caregiving roles and part-time workers. And speaking of minimum wage workers, I thought this budget was an opportunity for the government to recognize that the five cent an hour increase in the minimum wage uh, effective April 1st is insulting. In the spring, I tabled a motion calling on the government to establish a $15 minimum wage within two years. A year later, we have only moved five cents closer to $15. Just as workers need to be supported, so do small and medium-sized businesses, including those who work in tourism and arts and culture. While our neighbors in PEI and Nova Scotia have ensured support through the COVID storm, our government offered only peanuts. <coughs> Even if the Minister of Economic Development says our economy will rebound this year, we need to ensure our businesses survive until then. This is particularly noticeable in my riding, where many businesses rely on people from Cumberland County, just across the Nova Scotia border, uh, on being, for being customers. And the Premier said businesses who were, do, were doing well in the pandemic should be fine if they were viable before the pandemic. But that is insulting. One of the things that is often misunderstood about the economy is that when people don't have money in their pockets, then it can't circulate in the local economy. And I think we misunderstand that often when we're talking about where our money should go. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, people have not been able, it's not just been about not, not being able to go into a restaurant or a shop and spend their money. Sometimes people have not had money in their pocket to spend. And, and this has been unacceptable to have such a delay and such inadequate support for these businesses. I've had some businesses and farmers 
in my riding actually say they're going to just move to Nova Scotia because of the way the government's handled things and the way they're responding. They don't feel supported at all. And it's not just businesses in my riding that have suffered due to the border closures. People in my hometown of Sackville, and especially all across Tantramar, have experienced the pandemic differently than most other parts of the province. It is beyond frustrating that this government continues to ignore the needs of people living near these borders, who have dealt with the constantly changing, confusing, and contradictory border restrictions over the last year. And while we wait impatiently for April 19th for a maritime or an Atlantic bubble, I believe there are restrictions that can be safely eased and never should have been brought in in the first place. And these are the compassionate care exemptions that the government cut. And therefore, seniors and those requiring care had their care cut off, even when their caregivers are just across the border. And if you go from downtown Sackville to downtown Amherst, we're talking about 20 kilometers. And a lot of people are traveling there anyway for work, but we're talking about people who've lost their care. And I'm saying this again, Madam Speaker, this is unconscionable and unacceptable. When I first read the budget, I took lots of notes, and that's when I noticed in the entire document, poverty is not addressed. Not, not a, in, even one time the word poverty show up. And the word homelessness is mentioned once, yet they go hand in hand, and we see both every day across our province. The social assistance rates were increased by 5% last year and indexed this year which is positive, but it's not enough. We were hoping for more, especially during a housing crisis caused by a pandemic. And we are seeing this not just in urban areas, although obviously in urban areas there, there is a housing crisis, and we're seeing rents skyrocketing, and we're seeing a lack of affordable housing, but we're seeing it in rural areas as well. And while the government is putting advertisements to attract people to come to New Brunswick and buy a house, and, and are, people are attracted to our beautiful province and, and the lifestyle here, which is great. We can't ignore the impact that that's having because what's happening is people who are renting those houses currently are being told, you've got 30 days to get out and there's nowhere to go. There's, even if they had more money, there would be nowhere to go, Madam Speaker, because on some days there are no <laughs> rentals even listed in places like Sackville. And so this is serious. This, this is harming renters. And for months and months, we've been telling government, we need to do more about the housing crisis and, the, and what's happening to renters. And government said, we're not sure if there's even a problem. Well, there is a problem. And you can ask the people who are contacting my office and who are facing being unhoused across this province. One thing the government could do that could help when talking about poverty and housing is to eliminate the discriminatory household income policy for social assistance recipients. When people with disabilities get married, the income they depend on gets cut. Some decide not to get married for fear of losing this essential income. This is not fair, but moreover, it discriminates against some of the most vulnerable people in our society, and it appears to have an impact on women with disabilities in a disproportionate way. And so this seems like a good policy to examine if we are going to do GBA+, plus, if we are going to do gender-based analysis+, plus, this is a good policy to look at and, frankly, to change. Housing is a human right, but we don't treat it that way in our society. Housing people in shelters and other short-term lodgings is expensive, and it's not a suitable solution. And yet, government is not investing the needed funding in housing programs. We need more rental subsidies. We need to properly maintain the NB housing stock that is there. There are places sitting empty or that go into disrepair and then get sold. And so the housing stock for NB housing in some places might even be going down <laughs> because it's not being properly maintained and that is unacceptable. We already have a long wait list for housing support. And housing first is a proven strategy, especially if we're looking at mental health, we're looking at addictions. Housing is essential. Dans son discours, le ministre des Finances a fait état de 10,8 millions de dollars pour accroître la disponibilité de logements abordables dans tous les coins de la province. Bien que cet investissement soit le bienvenu, il n'est pas nouveau et il n'est pas suffisant. Il a été inclus dans le plan d'action fédéral provincial 2019 20 
2022. J'espérais voir un investissement nouveau bonifié dans le logement abordable, vu que le gouvernement reconnaît le manque de logements abordables et l'itinérance dans notre province. When it comes to health care, there is a lot to be said. And developing plans is not enough. Words on a page are not enough. The mental health needs in the community are clear and urgent, and steps could be taken in the budget to improve the lives of New Brunswickers, like extending Medicare coverage for psychotherapy or making sure that there are walk-in mental health clinics in every community health region. New Brunswickers from rural areas have the same needs for mental health as those in urban centers. I had hoped that mental health mobile crisis teams would be allocated funds specifically to become 24-7 first responders, trained to respond to mental health or wellness calls around the clock rather than police officers. This would have made a world of difference to New Brunswickers in need. In 2017, the Canadian Mental Health or Association recommended that mental health spending make up 9% of the total health budget. Yet even with an increase in mental health spending this year, it still only comprises 5.6% of the total budget, up marginally from 5.5% last year. This is still nowhere near enough. En plus, le gouvernement a called 2,3 millions de dollars pour le groupe de réduction de la criminalité de la GRC afin de réduire les drogues illégales dans la province et 2 millions de dollars supplémentaires pour renforcer cet investissement en créant un programme pour les communautés plus sûres. Cet argent serait bien mieux dépensé à aider les personnes dépendantes des drogues plutôt que les criminaliser davantage. La guerre contre les drogues n'a jamais réussi à résoudre les problèmes de santé mentale et de toxicomanie. Uh, Michel Boudreau, pr professeur de criminologie à l'Université Saint-Thomas, a qualifié ce programme de gaspillage d'argent. With this health budget, I wanted to see the Public Health Promotion and Prevention Unit increase their staff to address priorities identified in the community health assessments. With an aging population, targeted initiatives to prevent cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease could save us money in the long run as a province. But what it's ultimately about is having better health outcomes for the people of this province. Le fait de consacrer des ressources aux soins préventifs pour aider à prévenir les maladies permet non seulement d'obtenir de meilleurs résultats en matière de santé pour les personnes et les familles, mais des populations plus saines permettent de réaliser des économies en matière de soins de santé dans l'ensemble du système. Alors que les questions relatives aux travailleuses et travailleurs paramédicaux de soins avancés sont en train d'être traitées, les questions relatives à leur déploiement dans la province n'ont même pas été mentionnées dans le budget. Le modèle de déploiement dynamique utilisé à l'heure actuelle fait en sorte que les régions urbaines ne sont pas suffisamment soutenues, ce qui oblige les travailleurs paramédicaux à quitter les régions rurales pour apporter leur soutien, laissant ainsi ces communautés exposées. J'espérais également voir dans le budget un financement pour étendre le programme de sages-femmes de la province, qui a d'abord été déployé comme projet pilote à Fredericton en 2018. Malgré le succès retentissant de ce projet pilote, il n'a toujours pas été étendu à l'ensemble de la province trois ans plus tard. I was glad to see that the government committed to increasing the hourly wage for early childhood educators to $19 an hour this year. I would argue they deserve more, but instead of waiting until 2023, as was originally planned. This is an important step to ensure that these essential workers are properly recognized and compensated for, for the work that they do. And I want to give a special shout out to the early childhood educators who are no doubt taking care of my daughter Quinn right now. Ce que je n'ai pas vu, c'est de l'argent pour augmenter les salaires de, des psychologues scolaires pour rendre le Nouveau-Brunswick plus compétitif avec la Nouvelle-Écosse et l'île du Prince-Édouard. À la place, le ministre de l'Éducation veut ajouter à la charge de travail des enseignants en ressources en leur demande de faire des évaluations psychopédagogiques au lieu des psychologues scolaires qui sont formés pour le faire. La liste d'attente pour les évaluations est certainement un problème, mais ce n'est pas la bonne solution, Madame la Présidente. 
Les gens ne croient pas avoir le pouvoir de prendre des décisions qui ont des impacts sur leur communauté. Par exemple, les décisions concernant les fonds pour l'infrastructure de leurs écoles. Whether it be the location of the school, the, the infrastructure improvements that are needed, sometimes the water is leaking through the, the roof or the windows don't open and we have a ventilation issue, uh, especially with COVID. Um, all of the, and the specs of, of the new schools that are being built, I think these need to be revi revisited. Communities want a say. I was also disappointed to see no mention of post-secondary education in the finance minister's speech. Students have been through a lot this year, and I know students and universities are, are concerned. There is no guarantee that tuition increases will remain stable in the fall. I hope there's money in the budget to fund new MOUs or at least extend the current ones that will provide the universities with much needed funds while ensuring that the cost of tuition does not skyrocket. I would also add that there, there are needs for funding um, on post-secondary uh, campuses that have to do with, um, with health, with responses to um, sexual violence and the appropriate supports there. And we have seen increasingly that universities are being tasked with paying for health care. And I'm sure they do have an important role to play, but when it comes to health care, to mental health care, and to other services like that, the government ultimately is responsible, and yet the funds are not there, and they're, the, they're not adequate. Now, talking about infrastructure, so many New Brunswickers, technically everyone in my riding, live in rural areas. We need investments in our rural regions and not austerity. It is very clear that there are disgraceful <laughs> Uh, routes and highways who, that have been basically abandoned. Route 16 comes to mind, and they've been neglected for far too long. It is simply dangerous to drive in certain parts, and I'm specifically thinking of the stretch near Jolicure. Um, and then some roads don't even have a yellow line. And the 935, I've been fighting for the 935 to have a yellow line for years. I've been informed that they will, I think, be putting a yellow line this year, fingers crossed, but this is ridiculous. This is a safety issue, and the, the methodology for how they decide who gets a yellow line uh, doesn't seem right, and it seems that the least we can do for our citizens in rural areas is to paint a yellow line on the road. But rural roads have been so abandoned that, in fact, Canada Post informed residents on Jolicure Road that their mail will no longer be delivered because of the condition of their road. And they've said that they're not going to resume delivering mail until the condition of the road improves. So it has to be pretty bad for the dedicated post office workers to say, I'm sorry, it's too dangerous, it's inaccessible. What does that mean if an ambulance needs to be called to one of the residents that lives on Jolicure Road? There are also businesses there who are being neglected. Don't get, even get me started on the on the, the lack of dust control, on, on what happens in the spring on certain roads, it's really unacceptable. And what we see constantly is DTI is underfunded year after year, and there's not an adequate asset management program. And so even if they do work here and work there, it's inadequate and, and they never get caught up. And it's, it's just unacceptable. Nous avons besoin d'un plan de gestion des actifs réels et correctement financés pour le MTI et d'un financement annuel suffisant pour l'entretien. Peu importe dans quelle communauté vous vivez, qui est, qui est votre député ou votre gouvernement, nous méritons tous et toutes des routes sécuritaires. Il est inacceptable que le gouvernement ait arrêté les rénovations de l'Institut de Memram Cook et ait ensuite refusé de coopérer, coopérer et de consulter le village et les autres groupes communautaires. Même maintenant, le gouvernement doit encore investir dans cette importante institution et coopérer avec les gens de la communauté pour s'assurer que le projet répond aux besoins de la communauté. Même Mme Coq-Tantramar est particulièrement vulnérable aux changements climatiques. Les inondations en particulier sont une préoccupation majeure. Une grande partie de même Ramcook Tantramar est protégée des inondations par des digues qui datent de plusieurs siècles. Les aboiteaux de même Ramcook à Tantramar sont trop vieux 
ils doivent être remplacés. Et la montée des eaux et les types de tempêtes que nous avons connues ces dernières années les, les ont poussés à leurs limites. We need plans to help people in my riding and all across New Brunswick face the realities of our changing climate with emergency preparedness and investments in infrastructure like the dikes, like replacing the aboiteau, and, and planning for what happens when ultimately some of these dikes breach. Because frankly, that's the path we're on with rising sea levels. And there are communities that have been protected by those dikes for centuries that frankly are no longer safely protected. And we don't know for how much longer they will be. This year, the government will collect $163 million in carbon pricing revenue, and $78 million is being spent to reduce the excise tax on gas. $12 million is going to subsidize natural gas, and $9 million has been allocated to climate change and economic development initiatives for First Nations without consulting meaningfully with the chiefs of the communities that that money is intended for. $28 million remains unallocated, and people are even writing to me and saying, how, how can I share my idea for investments? I, ha I have ideas about how to green our local schools or, or energy projects. <laughs> the, people want the, the money invested in renewable energy, in energy efficiency, in addressing climate change in their communities. Alors, que reste-t-il? Le gouvernement ne consacre que 36 millions de dollars de la taxe sur le carbone au fond pour le changement climatique. L'année dernière, ils n'ont même pas dépensé des 36 millions de dollars, Madame la Présidente. Et une grande partie de ce qui a été dépensé là était pour des dépenses de routine du MTI, comme l'amélioration de l'efficacité énergétique de leurs bâtiments, le remplacement de, de pinceaux et l'amélioration des GPS sur le, les chasse-neige. Status quo funding for existing government programs is not going to si solve the climate crisis. It barely addresses it, Mrs. Speaker, Madam Speaker. $10 million from this year's fund will go to funding nuclear research, which will also not solve the climate crisis, despite what some members of government and the official opposition say. Even if it were a good idea, which I'm convinced that it's not, because of safety issues, waste issues, there's many issues there, we still can't wait the 10 to 15 years or more for this technology. This is not a solution to the climate crisis. To invest in SMRs, to spend $20 million on this. Wind and solar are proven and exist now. And we, frankly, we are already seeing the impacts of climate change. I'm sure every member, hopefully they're paying attention to this, there are already severe impacts on New Brunswickers. Food prices have gone up, are expected to go up even more, and, and the climate, reports are saying climate is to blame. Drought and wells, um, wells running dry, we saw the hay shortages, the crop failures, we're seeing lots of, of impacts. And there are economic opportunities to grow renewable energy companies and produce local goods that don't need to travel as far to reduce carbon pollution. Part of this needs to be connected to local food strategy that, it, that moves quickly and helps farmers, helps workers, and makes sure that people uh, can actually uh, afford food and have access to healthy food. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll reference um, my colleague from Kent North uh, has talked about how the Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries isn't technically responsible for food. But I think that would be a good place to start because uh, we, have, we have food security issues and food sovereignty issues here in our province. Le Canada est classé 61 sur 61 en termes d'efficacité énergétique et le NB est septième sur 10 des provinces en, en tant que uh, efficacité énergétique. Uh, En aidant à rendre les maisons plus éco-énergétiques, on s'attaquerait à plusieurs problèmes à la fois. Réduire notre consommation d'énergie en tant que province, réduire les coûts d'énergie pour les particuliers, y compris les aînés et les personnes à faible revenu, et aider l'argent à circuler dans l'économie locale. 
Things have moved too slowly for too long under successive governments, and it is just so frustrating. We, we can do more. Government can do more to, as a province to address the climate crisis, but frankly, we're just moving too slowly. I am glad that the government has finally completed uh, Gender-Based Analysis Plus, or GBA Plus, on the budget and have, as some might say, shown their receipts. There is a report that I found on the website. And I've been calling for this for many years, for departments to, to do this. I've been asking the estimate since I was elected, how, did you do GBA Plus? But there is still more to be done. Right now, there's a, a short document that's there. And what I would argue is, I'm, I'm glad that this has happened, and yet there are still blind spots in the policies that have not been captured. One example is that, you know, it's mentioned in there, female entrepreneurs have been impacted by COVID, and yet when we look at the f financial relief provided uh, in, the, in the grant that government uh, finally provided, sole proprietors were, were not included. And I can think of, of many, you know, women-dominated industries where the sole proprietors, I'm thinking of, you know, hairdressers, for example, um, that were impacted. And so there needs to be more analysis done and a deepening of the GBA+, plus and, and, and hopefully not sort of retroactively looking at what can we do for the budget. It needs to be from the beginning. Nous avons besoin de l'équité salariale et de stratégies de recrutement et de rétention solide pour tous les travailleurs et travailleuses du secteur des soins. Avec le vieillissement de la population, nous devons veiller à ce que nos aînés aient des options. Il existe de graves lacunes dans le soutien aux aînés, aux personnes handicapées et aux soins palliatifs lorsqu'il s'agit de soins à domicile. We also need to take steps to move the Legislative Assembly into the 21st century. I'm glad to see that, finally, after a full year into the pandemic, we will be debating a motion to have hybrid sittings tomorrow. I have been advocating for it since last April, and it's a year overdue, frankly. And I hope that after the pandemic, we will continue to have virtual options for both committee and for sitting for certain extraordinary circumstances, as laid out in the Legislative Assembly Act. I was also hoping that this budget would include more support for constituency offices, and this is something that, that would help everyone in the province that is served by an MLA, everyone so that we could have our constituency assistance be on a full-time basis, for example, to help serve our constituents and ensure that the legislative work, the attention that is needed for MLAs on bills and on the legislative work um, can happen. I, I know when you look at other jurisdictions like Nova Scotia, for example, where they have a full-time uh, constituency coordinator hired through the, uh, the, the legislature plus a budget on top of that. And this is ultimately about making sure that constituents are properly served. Uh, because frankly, as it stands, so many people come to our offices because there are gaps in our systems. There are gaps in government. People fall through the cracks and, and we, we help them. And so I wanna make sure that we, we have the resources to do so. And frankly, I don't think that MLA offices do at this point. And I wanna talk about revenue. <laughs> Tax evasion and tax havens are a significant problem. Tax breaks for some companies in our province are an obstacle to us having fair taxation in New Brunswick. And this idea uh, that we don't have any money in New Brunswick, it's not true. And frankly, the ideas of trickle-down economics are also not true. The money is flowing up to the rich and out of our province and out of our country. And the rich are hoarding the wealth at the expense of most New Brunswickers. On continue de dire à la population du Nouveau-Brunswick d'accepter le statu quo, alors que la richesse continue d'être concentrée entre les mains de quelques-uns. Ce n'est pas viable, ce n'est pas juste et ce n'est pas acceptable comme stratégie économique au 21e siècle. Madam Speaker, I often look around this room and think that I am measuring success differently than some other members. What if our focus wasn't GDP, but rather that all children and all New Brunswickers, for that matter, have meals and housing and heat? Bien sûr, l'argent, le PIB, la dette, tous les éléments de notre économie, c'est ce que vous intéresse. Et vous mesurez le PIB, la dette et leur ratio. Leur ratio. Je veux que vous mesuriez les résultats des inégalités de l'écart salarial, des taux de pauvreté, 
du nombre de personnes qui ont besoin de logements abordables, de l'insécurité alimentaire et plus encore. Le moment que nous vivons décidera de notre destin. Mon destin, le destin de ma fille, celui de ma circonscription, celui de tous les Néo-Brunswickois et Néo-Brunswickoises. Et si nous mesurons le PIB plutôt que la façon de créer les communautés résilientes et où il fait bon vivre, nous ne prendrons pas les bonnes mesures. Many of the challenges we face have had solutions proposed for decades. The perils of ignoring climate change and the solutions required to prevent its worst impacts have been known since before I was born. When we look at guaranteed livable incomes, that is not a new idea. There are many ideas that we've had for a long time, and frankly, it's time to move them forward faster. So, Madam Speaker, I ask, what are we waiting for? Because I, for one, am tired of waiting. Le ministre des Finances et le premier ministre affirment que le but du budget est de ré réinventer le Nouveau-Brunswick, mais tout ce que je vois, c'est encore le statu quo que nous avons vu de la part des gouvernements conservateurs et libéraux successifs. We need to be truly sustainable and realize that everything is in interconnected. Our economy, the environment, equity, social justice, and fixing one part while ignoring the others isn't really fixing anything at all. Merci. Thank you. Walal and Madam Speaker. I recognize the